if you will bear with us for a minute, there are people still arriving and we need more chairs. It will be only two or three minutes more. Is it working? Again? Good evening and thank you for coming. Over the years, it has been the privilege of this university's Committee on Pre-Legal Education, in company with the Lectures Committee and with generous financial assistance from the government of the student body, to bring to this campus a number of distinguished scholars, practitioners, and observers of our legal institutions from the bench and the bar and the academy. But the university has perhaps never been so privileged in these Law Day lectures as it is this evening, not only with respect to the intrinsic qualities of our guest, but also with respect to some significant departures she represents for these lectures. Mrs. Douglas is our first speaker to come from the tough crucible of elective politics and a personal incumbency in the legislative process. She is the first authority we have had on international affairs and their effect on domestic policies. She is our first speaker from the ranks of that new breed of public interest national organizations in civil liberties, consumer interests, environmental protection, and economic justice who are engaged in the hard business of getting legislative bodies and the public at large to overcome their inertia on critical public issues. And she possesses just probably the broadest talents and interests of anybody to appear in this series. Mrs. Douglas, of course, needs no introduction to anybody here who is of that generation which wants to hope for the building of a stable peace from the ashes of Western Europe and some measure of justice and equality throughout the world as generations of colonialism started coming to an end throughout the world. She was a leader in the articulation of those hopes as well as hopes for social justice at home. And as that, as that same generation also knows, some but not all of her capacity to contribute to the realization of those dreams was destroyed by the bipolarization of world power and the attendant fallout at home of fear, a fear which served as the seedbed of a viciousness and duplicity of a type previously unknown in American politics. But that is not why she is here. She is here on this law day not as a victim of what has been wrong about American society, but because she and her life still stand preeminently as examples of what is right about American society. Hers is a spirit of concern, tough-mindedness, compassion, and action, which caused her to be among the earliest Americans to recognize the Nazi regime for what it was and to speak out about it to be among the first to be working on the plight of migrant farm workers long before most of the nation realized that they were there, to be among the organizers of women as a definitive political force within a major political party of a major state. She would be one of the first women in Congress, and she would never allow ignorance or a transitory political defeat to diminish her efforts toward a world at peace and a nation with justice, which efforts she pursues today. She has had an incredibly talented and diverse career. She went straight from Barnard College to the Broadway stage, where she was a full-blown star before she was 30. Later, as an opera and concert artist, she performed throughout the United States, Canada, and Europe, including performances at the Salzburg Festival. Ultimately, in 1937, she would leave Salzburg without fulfillment of her contract because of her sudden realization of the nature of the Nazi menace within Austria itself. It was then that she turned to public service. 
From 1940 to 1944, she served as Democratic National Committee woman from California and as vice chairperson of the Democratic State Central Committee, although they didn't call them chairpersons then. In 1944, she was elected to the House of Representatives from the 14th District of California, from which she was re-elected in 1946 and 1948. She was assigned immediately to the House Foreign Affairs Committee, and she would serve on that committee during one of the most critical periods in American foreign relations, the development of the United Nations, the development of the Marshall Plan, the emergence of hostility in Eastern Europe, the development of the Truman Doctrine, and the development of the American reaction to the two-power confrontation. One of her current projects is assistance in the editing and publishing, finally, of the executive sessions of the House Foreign Relations Committee in that period. When she left Congress, a resolution of commendation for her distinguished service was signed by every member of the committee, Republican and Democrat. <coughs> In 1950, Mrs. Douglas revealed herself as that rare, honest politician who would stand against much of the short-range sentiment of a major constituency and against the real interests of powerful financial interests in her state. She opposed the late Senator Sheridan Downey of California in the Democratic primary on the two hottest issues in California, federal versus state control of offshore oil drilling and the revenues therefrom, and the efforts of large landed interests to encroach on the purposes and provisions of the Reclamation Act. She whipped Senator Downey soundly in the primary. Then came the general election, the Korean War, war and what was just probably the filthiest campaign ever conducted by any candidate in American political history. For that rare person here, who does not know about that campaign, suffice it to say that while Mrs. Douglas discussed issues, there was perfected the technique which had started with the defeat of Congressman Jerry Voorhees in 1946 and would eventuate in the first resignation by an American president to avoid impeachment. In 1946, Mrs. Douglas was appointed by President Truman to be alternate delegate to the UN General Assembly. She served on the board of the American Christian Palestine Committee from her time in Congress until its just dissolution just a few years ago. She has main, maintained a strong working interest in foreign affairs, including two study tours of Latin America and three study tours of the Middle East. <clears throat> Mrs. Douglas was a member of the National Advisory Committee on Farm Labor from 1958 until its dissolution in 1972. She has served three full terms as a member of the Advisory Council of the Columbia School of Social Work. In international affairs, Mrs. Mrs. Douglas was a member of the Jane Addams Peace Association delegation of the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom to the Second Soviet American Conference in Moscow in 1964. President Lyndon Johnson appointed her special ambassador to head the American delegation to the inauguration of President V.S. Tubman of Liberia in 1964. She is a member of the Board of Sponsors of the Women's Lobby and a member of the National Advisory Council to the Federation of Organizations for Professional Women. In addition to all this service since her congressional career, Mrs. Douglas has published a book, The Eleanor Roosevelt We Knew, and is at work on a book at the present time. As you might suspect, she has collected a few honors. She holds two honorary doctorates of law, and she has been honored for outstanding contributions to civil liberties by the New Jersey Civil Liberties Union and the American Civil Liberties Union chapter of Los Angeles. And she has been honored with the Louise Waterman Award of that tough old organization of civil libertarians, the American Jewish Congress. Mrs. Douglas is in constant demand for lectures and we are grateful to her for stopping in Iowa. She lives part of the time in New York and she is one of the most blessed of all people, a person with an old house in Vermont, where she lives with her husband of 45 years, Melvin Douglas, and on occasion, a whole passel of grandchildren. That she is not preoccupied with the past is revealed by the title of the address she has written for this occasion, Where Is It All Headed? It is indeed an honor to welcome to Iowa 
Mrs. Helen Gehagen Douglas. I'm going to begin with a poem by Emily Dickinson that I very often uh, begin a lecture with. I'm nobody. Who are you? Oh, are you nobody too? Then there's a pair of us. Don't tell. They'll banish us, you know. How dreary to be somebody, a public, like a frog, to tell your name the live long day to an admiring bog. That's it. <laughs> 1912, I stood in the Bibliothèque Nationale with my father in a room lined with books, the size of this maybe, maybe a little larger, from floor to ceiling. He pointed to a corner of the room and said, Helen, if you were to remain in this room for the rest of your life, you'd probably not be able to read more than just those books in that corner. It's not enough to read. You must analyze what you read. You must learn to think about what you read objectively. You must develop your brain so that you can think. Father believed that the education of women was not only desirable but necessary. I think he really didn't like to be with ladies he didn't think were educated. He started working on me at a very early age. He warned over and over again against being easily taken in by what is said and what one reads. In the middle of the 50s, I gave an address on the arms race entitled, What Do You Think About What You Think You Think About? <laughs> the title was inspired by a statement on thinking by the world famous biochemist Dr. Sven Georgi. You may ask, don't we all think? But not according to St. Georgi, as he defines thinking. He says, scientific thinking means that if we are faced with a problem, we approach it without preconceived ideas and sentiments like fear, greed, or hatred. We approach it with a cool head and collect data which we eventually try to fit together. That's all there is to it, said Sven Georgi. It may sound simple, but it isn't easy. What makes it difficult is the fact that our brain is not made to search for the truth. It is but another fang, it is another organ of survival, like the fang or the claw. So the brain mostly does not search for truth, but for advantage. And it tries to make us accept as truth what is only interest, mostly short-range interest, allowing our thought to be nominated by our desires. Our social theories, therefore, are made mostly to justify our actions, not to lead them. This is a time when we need to think scientifically. Our 1776 Declaration of Independence that rang around the world, how should we celebrate that? How are we celebrating it? This 200th anniversary of that memorable event by buying artifacts with eagles on them? Oh, I know that every anticipated national event is, is, mem uh, is remembered by some commemoration such as souvenir plates, mugs, cups, even antimacassars. But surely, in this period of history, 
in our 20th anniversary, our 200th anniversary. We must celebrate it with a searching appraisal of where we are and where we seem to be going. And above all, by examining our beliefs and values in this year of 1976. Do we believe that all men are created equal? Do we believe in a government of the people? Do we believe that our government derives its powers from us? Do we believe that we are endowed by the creator with certain unalienable rights, among which are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness? Do we believe that our government is instituted to ensure these rights? Do we believe that when government is destructive of these rights, it is our right to alter or abolish it and to institute a new government laying its foundation on such principles and organizing its powers in such form as shall seem most likely to affect our safety and happiness? Do we believe any of this really today? Or have we lost our concern for how we are governed? In 1972, 45% of those eligible to vote didn't vote. Why? Was it because, uh, in the, why was it in these early primaries this year that one out of five didn't register and vote? Was it because of the registration being too difficult, and why was that? Was it out of lazy indifference, or was the registration process so cumbersome and restrictive that it didn't allow those who move from state to state because of work, or out of the country, or in search of work, to qualify? Or did sickening cynicism cause registered voters not to go to the polls in the belief that a vote could in no way change? what the White House or the Congress would do after the election? Or was it failure to vote because of stultifying apathy? Were some voters so burdened with everyday problems and cares, so weary that they had no heart to keep track of what their government was doing in their name with their money? Or was it because threatening worldwide developments were beyond their ken. Can we be indifferent to the fact that nearly one half of the eligible voters didn't go to the polls in 72? And that 40% didn't go to the polls in 68? I think not. Lack of interest in governmental policy is too serious to be casually dismissed. Campaigning is more than a political battle between two major parties, more than a vote-catching contest with no holes barred. A growing number of people are uninterested in government. Can liberty long be assured? The power of the people having been established must be protected. The power of the people in a democracy isn't unassailably guaranteed against erosion. The power of the people isn't guaranteed in perpetuity. The price of liberty is, as Jefferson said, eternal vigilance. It is easy to easier to establish a government based on a framework of law and justice than to preserve it. This is law day. Law is an honorable profession, if honorably used. If I were a lawyer in this bicentennial year, I would consider it a privilege, opportunity, to remind voters that the liberty we say we take too much for granted sometimes was not easily come by. In, this 18th, in the 18th century, men were walled in by habit and circumstances. The Constitution and the Bill of Rights were a breakthrough to freedom. Monumental testimony to the founders' understanding of human nature and human need. A belief in the capacity of human beings to think for those trained in the law, it's a privilege to illuminate the Declaration of Human Rights, which rang the bell of freedom around the world in 1776, a privilege to tell the story again of how the founders, in order to free men from the yoke of tyranny, devised a government based on law. The Jeffersonians, knowing how power 
tends to corrupt, tempting men to use it for their own interest, devised a framework of government in which the power of the state was divided into three bodies. As an added protection, they gave to each body certain checks and balances on the other two. In this way, the founders hoped to achieve a lasting balance of power. Looking ahead, certain that there would be those in this new land, in this new society, who would go beyond the prescribed restrictions of the Constitution, they wrote a further protection, the impeachment provision. This process provided for the removal from office for, for constitutional, of constitutional offenders. We had a spectacular example of the founders' farsightedness in the last administration when it was uncertain whether or not the president, Richard Nixon, would comply with the court's order to produce tapes and documents. A Charles Warren senior fellow of American history, in American history at Harvard Law School, Raul Berger, who has spoken here to you at the university, spoke out at that time. In a Harper's Magazine article entitled Impeachment, the Instrument of Regeneration, he advised, if Mr. Nixon were again to refuse to comply with a court order to produce tapes and documents, that would constitute subversion of the Constitution. He reminded his readers that ours is a government of enumerated and limited powers, designed, in the words of the founders, to fence the Congress and the executive about, to and to police these limits, the courts were given the power of judicial review. I could feel Raoul Berger's outrage when he demanded to know by what reasoning the president claims to be exempted from this judicial authority. In disobeying court order, he said, the president would undermine a central pillar of the Constitution and take a long step toward assertion of dictatorial power. Benign or otherwise, said Dr. Berger, dictatorial power is utterly incompatible with our democratic system. Disobedience of a court order would be subversive of the constitutional, of the Constitution, which is the cardinal impeachment offense. It was James Madison, you know, one of the principal drafters of the Constitution, who argued in the first Congress for a president to be given the exclusive right of removing his subordinates from office if, he said, they broke the law. It will, he said, make the president, in a peculiar manner, responsible for their conduct and subject him to impeachment. Himself, said Madison, if he neglects to superintend their conduct so as to check their excesses. It is the president alone in whom the Constitution had vested the overall responsibility for the conduct of the executive branch in faithfully carrying out the laws passed by the Congress and signed by him. When we, the people, in the 50 states, vote for the next president, we'd better know before, we take, before he takes his oath of office and before we go to the polls exactly what the duties of a president are when he takes the solemn vow, I do solemnly swear that I will faithfully execute the office of the President of the United States and will, to the best of my ability, preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. And when we vote for the men and women who will represent us in the next Congress, we had better know before they take their oaths to uphold the Constitution to what they commit themselves. The failure of the Congress to shoulder its constitutional share of governmental power in the last Congresses, not so much this last one, but the ones before that, last 10 years before that, 15 years before that, undermined that delicate balance of power that the founders sought to achieve and worked so hard to obtain and to make lasting. And we have to also remember when we go to the polls, something we were talking about today, that the next president may be appointing three more justices to the Supreme Court.
because we will live with the Supreme Court long after presidents have departed from the White House. Lawyers have helped us in the past shake out the chaff and husband the healthy grain of democracy. Lawyers have understood the high mission of law in this government based on law, have helped people again and again to recapture the understanding of those basic principles that have secured freedom for 200 years in this country. It is the wise judges who have understood, who have been the watchful guardians of democracy. Judge Learned Hand was such a jurist. When he opinioned, it is the power of reiterated suggestion and concentrated platitude that at this moment has brought our entire civilization to imminent peril of destruction. The individual is helpless against it. Not only is it possible for these means, by these means, to shape his tastes, his feelings, his desires, and his hopes, but it is possible to convert him into a fanatical zealot. Thus, the vastest conflict with which mankind has ever been faced, whose outcome still remains undecided, in the end may turn upon whether the individual can survive. This is a time of testing of our beliefs and our morals. Many of you who aspire to the law may handle cases in defense of freedom, religion, speech, assembly, freedom of the press in the years to come. Some of you may be heard in cases before the Supreme Court. Some of you may cast the deciding vote on whether our freedoms will continue to be enjoyed in this country. Leonard Levy, constitutional historian, in his book Against the Law, argues that the Bill of Rights requires an ardently sympathetic, if not a liberal, activist court. He insists there is no way for the guarantees of the Bill of Rights to have real meaning if not enforced by unstinting affirmation that keep restraints on government. The loss of a highly tuned judicial mind will be felt throughout the country for years to come. We mourn the recent departure from the Supreme Court because of illness of one of our greatest justices, William O. Douglas. For 36 and a half years, he stood four square in protection of the Constitution. When the constitutionality of the Smith Act, passed by Congress in 1940, was challenged in the Dennis versus United States case, the Supreme Court upheld the act. Justice Douglas dissented. It wasn't until 1957 that the Supreme Court made the Smith Act inoperative. Justice Douglas's dissenting opinion in the Dennis versus United States case during those dark days of Joe McCarthy turned on the light of Jeffersonian thinking when he wrote then in, in, in an opinion which applies today as the, the excrescences and the violations of the law have been enumerated for us in the two committees, one in the Senate and one in the House. I read to you now Justice Douglas's opinion. There was a time in England, said he, when the concept of constructive treason flourished. Men were punished, not for raising a hand against the king, but for thinking murderous thoughts about him. The framers of the Constitution were alive to that abuse and took steps to see that the practice would not flourish here. Treason was defined to require overt acts. The evolution of a plot against the country into an actual project. The present eve, the present case, said Douglas, is not one of treason, but the analogy is close when the illegality is made to turn on intent and not on the nature of the act. 
We then start probing men's minds for active, for active and purpose, for action and purpose. They become entangled in the law, not with what they did, but for what they thought. They get convicted not for what they said, but for the purpose with which they said it. The doctrine of conspiracy has served diverse and oppressive purposes, said Douglas, and in its broad reach can be made to do great evil. But never until today has anyone seriously thought that the ancient law of conspiracy could constitutionally be used to turn speech into sedition conduct. Seditious conduct. Yet that is precisely, said he, what is suggested. I repeat that we deal here with speech alone, not with speech plus acts of sabotage or unlawful conduct. Not a single seditious act is charged in the indictment. To make a lawful speech unlawful because two men conceive it is to raise the law of conspiracy to appalling proportions. That course is to make a radical break with the past and to violate one of the cardinal principles of the constitutional scheme. Free speech, said Douglas, has occupied an exalted position because of the high service it has given our society. Its protection is essential to the very existence of democracy. The airing of ideas releases pressures which otherwise might become destructive. When ideas compete in the marketplace for acceptance, full and free discussion exposes the faults and they gain few adherents. Full and free discussion, even of ideas we hate, encourage the testing of our prejudices and our preconceptions. Full and free discussion keeps a society from becoming stagnant and unprepared for the stresses and strains that work to tear all civilizations apart. I think the opinion is worth reading today. I think it's very applicable. In drafting the Bill of Rights, James Madison forbade Congress to make laws prohibiting freedom of the press. Thomas Jefferson warned that if people expect to be free, the Washington Post and the New York Times. Justice William O. Douglas declared in a concurring opinion that the First Amendment was adopted explicitly to block punishment for the dissemination of materials embarrassing to the powers that be. Secrecy in government, he stated, is fundamentally undemocratic, perpetuating bureaucratic error. Debate on public questions must be uninhibited, robust, and wide open. Pentagon case, Papers case should have ended the government's attack of the press. It didn't. Today, Daniel Shore, CBS TV correspondent, bears the brunt of efforts to muzzle the press so that government can continue whenever it sees fit in the future to withhold information of actions it is undertaking in our name at home and around the world. The following is a text of a letter sent February 27, 1976, to Richard Salant, president of CBS News, by Ira Nyra, executive director of the American Civil Liberties Union. It reveals how continuing is the harassment of the press in the hope of intimidating them. Dear Mr. Salant, I write to express regret that Daniel Shore has been relieved of his duties as a CBS correspondent. This action appears to give credence to the charge that Mr. Shore did something wrong. No such charge was warranted. I'm writing to you, of course, aware that Mr. Shore appears to concede that his suspension is proper. Experience has quickly taught us Mr. Shore is quoted as saying in the New York Times that it is not possible to work as a reporter while personally involved in a controversy over a reporter's rights. And I accept that reality, said Mr. Nyer. The time, uh, Mr. Uh, said Mr. Sh uh, uh, Shore, Daniel Shore, 
The Times report does not make clear, said Mr. Nyer, whether this interview of Mr. Shores was on his own volition or whether it was imposed on him by the CBS. Since I have not spoken to Mr. Shore or any of the other principals in the matter, I do not presume to comment on the sequence of events which led to the statement. But assuming that the statement I have quoted reflects a view of Mr. Shores arrived at without pressure, I would still wish that CBS had acted differently. In my view, CBS should have urged Mr. Shore to continue covering the intelligence agencies or failing that to take some other reporting assignment. In that way, CBS would demonstrate its complete rejection of the charges of impropriety by Mr. Shore. Even if Mr. Shore had declined to continue on active assignment, I wish you had let it be known that the CBS urged him to continue to work. And then this concluding paragraph. For Daniel Shore to be suspended because some people in the government are attacking him seems to be analogous to suspending publication of the New York Times and the Washington Post when the Nixon administration attacked them for publishing the Pentagon Papers. Or it would be analogous to suspending all those at CBS associated with the production of the selling of the Pentagon when it became a matter of controversy. At that time, you will no doubt recall, a committee of the House of Representatives voted a contempt citation against CBS and a similar action by the entire House of Representatives was only narrowly defeated by one vote. My comments about the New York Times and the Washington Post are made with the full knowledge that those newspapers do not recognize the analogy. The editorial comments on the matter seem to me to be disgraceful. It is not too late, sir, even now for the CBS to call on Daniel Shore and return to return to an active reporting assignment. I urge that you take such steps. Now I have the letter also from Mr. Salant back to, to the Civil Liberties Union. If anybody wants to see it, I'd be happy to show it to them. Uh, uh, in, in part, it, it answers this uh, uh, acceptably. In another part, it leaves it kind of up in the air. But this is a continuing harassing of the press in order finally to break them down. It was the press that alerted us to what was happening in Vietnam. Four administrations conspired to keep us ignorant of the extent of US involvement in Southeast Asia. Had we been beware from the very beginning of all the facts, I doubt if a majority of us would have supported the Vietnam War, the longest, most costly war in our history, a war costly in lives, those of our soldiers and of the Southeast Asia a war that ravished the earth and those far off lands, a war of this brutal and destructive, of ancient patterns of living, a war that demeaned our leadership in the world that desperately needs an example of international rectitude, a war which gave heartbreaking examples of how power dare not be used and cannot be used a war that conditioned our young men, our young people here, young boys and girls growing up to 10 long years to daily violence, inuring them to killing as they listened to governmental rep daily reports of our success based on a greater ratio of killing than that of the enemy. We tried to block out our country's reckless venture. There's one way and one way only to block it out, and that is to begin to practice what we profess as our principles. We can reinstate ourselves in the eyes of the world, but I think we have to recognize, our, recognize that we need to reinstate ourselves if we're going to be thought of, trusted, as we had been before that time, that tragic time. People must have peace. And leadership directed toward that end is desperately needed. And God willing, I hope we can help give it. Presently before the Congress is Senate Bill 1. There's widespread popular opposition to it from such prestigious organizations as the New York Bar Association, the International 
Press Institute and also the opposition of local committees and ad hoc committees throughout the country. The bill was originally intended as a systematic codification of criminal statutes now scattered unsystematically through the body of law. A long year study by a presidential commission appointed by President uh, Lyndon Johnson, chaired by California's ex-governor Edmund Brown, resulted in 1969 in a report which was supposed to serve as the basis for a congressional bill, one which civil libertarians would have found acceptable, wholly acceptable. Nixon had assumed the presidency when the Brown Commission submitted its report to Congress. What has happened to the report in drafting S-1 is unacceptable and worth a close scrutiny by students of the law. We can lose our freedom, you know. They can slip away from us without our realizing what has happened. In the name of security, which can be interpreted very broadly, there has been a continuing hacking away at the pillars of liberty. It has mostly been the lawyers and the scholars who have pointed out what was happening in law journals and lectures and in constitutional cases before the courts. Reporting of such cases appeared to, in some newspapers throughout the country, but were read and understood by all too few. How widespread today is ignorance of the Constitution and the Bill of Rights? And if it is widespread, how does this ignorance affect our liberty, directly and indirectly? How can we tell what is happening if we don't understand what our rights are and the origin of those rights? Why they were enunciated as rights Ignorance of the laws that have guaranteed our freedom for 200 years fails to prepare us, I'm afraid, for the strains and stresses of our time. What are the strains and stresses of our time? And I want to talk about our time. We live in a new age. We were blown into it toward the end of World War II when the Air Force, at the instruction of the Commander-in-Chief, dropped a new kind of bomb in Hiroshima which destroyed the city, killed 100,000 people, and sickened some 70,000 more. That fatal single bomb ended the war as it was hoped it would, or might. It also ended the sense of security we had enjoyed in this country for over 200 years. The destructive force of the Hiroshima bomb frightened us more than we realized at the time. Although at that time, the fact that it ended the war was all that seemed to matter. When we began to understand what that one bomb had done, we became the victims, I think, of nameless fear. Nameless because the splitting of the atom that made the new bomb possible was incomprehensible to so many. There was no gradual psychological preparation for the new time in which we found ourselves and in which so many pe people feel as though they're bewildered strangers. The fact that science had discovered the power of the sun was beyond the grasp of most lay people. We were absolutely sure only of one thing, and of one thing we were sure. We, the good people, and we'd always thought of ourselves as the good people, if we, the good people, had dropped a bomb that devastated a city and its people, we couldn't be trust any other nation not to do the same. And we determined to make sure that it wouldn't ever happen to us. The shock of this new weapon, of course, aroused worldwide anxiety and led to universal agreement among governments and people that there must never again be a major war. Disarmament and regulation of arms were explicit goals in the United Nations Charter. Disarmament has been the universally recognized crucial issue of our times. Despite that fact, universal, of rec universal recognition, terrible new weapons against which there is no defense have made war 
as an instrument of foreign policy absolute, obsolete, despite that fact, the conferences on disarmament in the United Nations and outside the United Nations have failed to check the arms race. And the arms race has gone on at an ever more accelerated pace. In the immediate post-war years, we offered the atchison Lilienthal Plan in the United Nations. The plan would have established international control of atomic energy and prevented individual nations, other nations, from producing their own atomic bombs. Nothing came of it. The shock of that first atomic bomb had had a profound impact abroad. Others were fearful of the new weapon as weak and felt as unsafe. The Russians flatly turned it down. They were suspicious of us as we were of them, and they wanted their own atomic bomb. The United States government determined to keep secret the process, therefore, by which we had constructed our bomb. If we couldn't have other nations agree to us, agree with us, not to make bombs, at least we wouldn't tell them how we'd made ours, and maybe we could keep it a secret. And so we strengthened security controls, home and abroad. It was hoped that in this way we could stop, or at least delay, the spread of nuclear weapons. Well, of course, that wasn't possible. The fact that an atomic bomb could be made was the secret. It was no longer a secret from the day it was dropped in Hiroshima. Moreover, the scientific work that led to the splitting of the atom bomb had taken place in Europe. And the knowledge that it was acquired in Europe made it possible later in the United States to make that bomb. A reading of Einstein on Peace, prefaced by Bertrand Russell, I advise you to get and read to cover this whole period. It'll tune you in, as it were, on the new age. And now I'm going to paraphrase some of the steps that led to the splitting of the atom, which is an unbelievably fascinating story. The first step was taken by Henri Becquerel in 1896, who discovered the radioactivity of uranium. 1902, the second step was taken by Marie and Henri, uh, Pierre, uh, uh, by Marie and Pierre Curie in isolating radium. And then when Albert Einstein stated his revolutionary equation in 1905, that energy equals mass multiplied by the square of the speed of light, the race was on by European scientists to find a way to split the atom and release the energy. Throughout the 20s and 30s, physicists strove to pull atoms apart by bombarding them with various kinds of particles. In 1932, James Chadwick, English physicist, discovered a new particle of proton size, the neutron. In 1934, Enrique Fermi in Italy and Irene and Frederica Giulio Curie in France, using neutron beams, produced the disintegration of heavy atoms, but failed to interpret the process as splitting of the atom, which it was. In 1938, two German scientists, Otto Hahn and Fritz Strassmann, at the Kaiser Wilhelm Gesellschaft in Berlin, identified one of the large fragments produced in the neutron bombardment of heavy of the heavy element uranium as barium, an element roughly half the size of uranium. But they didn't identify it. Hans sent an advanced copy to Lisa Meitner, his old time colleague who was a German refugee living and working in Sweden. Lisa Meitner surmised at once that the Hans Strassmann experiment had split the atom in two approximately equal parts and must have released an enormous amount of energy. Meitner and her nephew, Otto Frisch, prepared a paper to that effect. Before its publication in 1939, it's getting near the time you all were born, Meitner sent it to Niels Bohr, Danish theoretical physicist and one of the most notable contributors to the world's knowledge of atomic structure. Bohr immediately grasped the vast implications of the discovery. 
and discuss some of them at a scientific meeting in Washington, D.C., late in January 1939. His news created a sensation. Some of the American scientists left the hall immediately to go back to their laboratories to try to prove it themselves. Before or during the early years of the war, refugee scientists, some of those I have mentioned, Fermi, Zillard, Wigner, Victor Weisskopf, Edward Teller, and of course, Albert Einstein, came to the United States. They were anxious to accelerate the development of atomic research, fearful that the Germans might produce an atomic bomb from this new power and therefore have control of the world. At the urgent insistence of Leo Szilard, with the assistance of Albert Einstein, President Roosevelt was reached and informed that Hahn and Streisemann at the Kaiser Wilhelm Gesellschaft in Berlin had split the atom and that it might be possible to make a bomb from this atomic power and that the Germans might be doing just that at that time. Franklin Roosevelt gave his endorsement to a federally supported atomic research project, which came to be known as the Manhattan Project. It was kept secret. None of us knew in Washington that this was going on, except a very few people, because it was feared that the Germans would find out what we were doing. The project led to the development, of course, of the Hiroshima bomb and to our being blown into a new age. Dr. Robert Oppenheimer, who was the scientific director of the Manhattan Project, had this to say about the new age. In an interview in the late 50s or early 60s, he said, man's dignity and responsibility never again can be based on a microcosmic notion of his condition. And he went on to say, when you count all, this, all the men who have brought contributions to science, and technology since the beginning of history, 90% are alive today.